All right, so today I'd like to discuss the idea of relations on sets. I'm on YouTube. I always dream to be at a YouTuber. Mike, can I please get back to the lecture here? The, oh, you've been jealous of my good looks since the fourth grade, pal. Yeah, whatever you need to tell yourself. Let's I'll compliment your looks later. So, all right, relations on sets. Here is the definition. We need a few definitions for our definition. So one definition is um, the definition of cross product or Cartesian product. Um, depending on how you want to how you want to call it. So, um, if you're given two sets, right, A and B, then the Cartesian product is probably the most common name for it. But it's written with the same symbol as cross product that you'd use in, in say in multivariable calculus. Um, the Cartesian product A cross B. What it is, is it's the set of all ordered pairs where one element was chosen from A and one element was chosen from B, right? And you can mix and match them in any way you like. Um, so just to show a quick little example of that, for example, a very famous cross product that we work with all the time is the, the plane, right? The plane that you do sort of all of you know, college algebra in, right? Um, that you could say is the set R cross R, right? Because it's the set of all X comma Y where one X coordinate is chosen from the real numbers and the other coordinate, the Y coordinate is also chosen from the real numbers, right? So so that's the, the plane. And that's why sometimes you'll see the plane written like this, R to the second power. It's because it's in a certain sense, it's R times R, where the times is Cartesian product, right? So that's why that's a, a name for the plane. Um, but you can do it with any with any set. You don't you don't have to necessarily do it with um, just um, real numbers, right? It can even be just tiny little finite sets. For example, suppose you had the set A is just um, heads tails, right? And you're just thinking about flipping a coin, right? You can say, all right, well, what happens if I flip two coins? Well, that's essentially the cross product enumerates all of those outcomes, right? What can you have? You could have uh, heads and a heads. You could have a heads and a tails. You could have a tails and a heads, or you can have a tails and a tails. And if you want, even in the case where it's a finite set, you could still think of this as a um, kind of a two-dimensional process, right? You could think, just think of this axis down here only has two elements on it. Instead of having infinitely like many, it has the heads and the tails, right? And then this axis has also just two elements, the heads and tails. And then those four points represent those four um, elements in the set, right? The heads, 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 comma, heads, heads comma tails, tail comma heads, and tails comma tails. So that's, um, uh, those are two examples of, of Cartesian products of sets, right? So that's that's one definition that we need it, to define relations, right, is Cartesian product. Now, another definition that we need is we need the idea of a subset. So a set A is a subset of a set B if and only if every element of A is also an element of B. Right, another way to say this is we want every element of A to also Write this a little, little differently. Let's say we have a universal set U, right? So for, if for any element that you pick in the universal set, if that element is an element of A, then it automatically must also be an element of B. That makes A a subset of B, right? Um, and we have a, so that's the notion of subset, and we have special notation for this 
the there's a symbol for a subset which is just like less than or equal to, except you round it right? instead of making it pointy like you would for quantities, right? If it's rounded, then that means um, subset instead of a numerical quantity being less than some other numerical quantity. Right? So this is our, our notion of Cartesian product first, right? Our first definition, our second definition, subset. And just to show a short example, right? You, of the kind of things you would write using subset, you could say, the say natural numbers are a subset of the integers, right? Is a, an example, right? The, why? Well, because every element of the natural numbers, say three, for example, um, is a element of the naturals. And sure enough, it follows, it does follow that three is a element of the integers, right? So all of the um, members of the first set are also in the in the second, right? So, and not just three, but any any natural number, right? Um, so that's a, an example of a, a subset, right? You can also say the integers is a subset of the integers, right? Nowhere did we say that um, a set couldn't be a, considered a subset of itself. Every element of the integers is an element of the integers. Perfectly valid, right? You can also say the empty set is a subset of the integers. Also perfectly valid. The empty set doesn't have any elements. So, but automatically all, even though there are none, all of them vacuously are contained in the integers. Right? So those are three three quick examples of, of subset relations. Now, from here, I actually have everything I need to define relation. So a relation between sets A and B is a subset of their Cartesian product. Right. So a relation between sets A and B is a subset of their Cartesian product. Why, right? Why are we calling this a relation? Uh, what does this construction look like? Well, here's the, um, Here's the idea, and you know, and let me actually use a little more notation here, um, and then we'll then we'll do an example. Um, so suppose we call this relation R, right? If it's a relation R. Then you'd say that R is a subset of A cross B. And if an ordered pair A, B is in R, because that's what R consists of. It's some subset of the ordered pairs of A cross A, or A cross B, right? With, so you know, little A is chosen from big A and little B is an element of big B, right? Then often we write, this relation in what's called infix notation. Um, A is related to B. So you put A and then some symbol, maybe subscript with an R to indicate what relation it is. Or maybe we have a special symbol if it's a special relation, um, right? To mean that A is related to B in this, in this relation. Um, so a lot of notation, a lot of sort of abstract uh, jargon and symbology here. Let's let's look at a, a concrete example. So let's say, for example, let's say A is the set, let A be the set of um, people, right? Set of all people. And let's let B be the set of Um, the set of U.S. states, right? 50, 50 states of the U.S. Um, then what does, first let's just think about what A cross B looks like. A cross B here is a massive, massive set, right? Um, and what all would be there? Well, any combination of any ordered pair with a person as the first coordinate, 
and a state as the second coordinate. Right? So we could have me, comma, um, Colorado, right? This would be a one element of A cross B. We could have me, comma, uh, Idaho, right? We could have Oprah, comma, Florida, et cetera, right? Literally any, right, any person and then any state, right? That's what lives all in this, in this set. Um, Right. So here I just wrote out four elements, but this has way more than four elements, right? This has something like what, 50 times the number of people <laughs> options, right? Um, is how many elements would be would be in here? So uh, was this, you know 50 times seven billion, right? Would be uh, so was it about th about 350 billion elements is is what would be in this set, massive massive set, right? Um, but then you could specify that maybe I don't want to consider all of them. So maybe I want to think just of people and states that are related in a particular way. And I mean, you could define a relation to be any relation you're interested in. So let's let R be the relation has visited. So that is, we'll say that R is going to be the relation that carves out just the ordered pairs in which person A has visited state. That would be a, a a perfectly good way to define this relation. So we can then say what this subset would look like, right? This subset R would then, for example, would include can Colorado. I've clearly visited Colorado. I live here, um, right? But it would not include can Idaho. I've never been to Idaho, right? So so that that element would get, it's part of A cross B, but it would not be part of R, right? Um, it would certainly include really Crystal, New Jersey, right? Um, and it would include lots and lots and lots of other pairs, right? Of recording every person that has ever been in every state, right? Every combination of a person having visited the state would be in this gigantic relation. Right. Now, there are um, different ways to represent relations. Sometimes you represent them just like I am here by listing out ordered pairs. Also, sometimes it's convenient to represent relations by these sort of blob diagrams where you draw your sets A and B. So you enumerate the sets Right, you show um, these sets A and B listing out each element. And then the relation you could draw by drawing lines to connect elements of these sets, right? So I have visited Colorado, so I would draw a line there, right? I have also visited New Jersey, so I would draw a line there, right? Billy Crystal has visited New Jersey, so I would draw a line there. I actually don't know if Billy Crystal's ever been to Colorado or not. I have no idea. So I won't draw the line there, but maybe there could be, depending on whether or not Billy Crystal has ever been to, to Colorado. So that's our, um, that's a, a nice way to, to visualize relations. Right? Um, but you see the relation is a subset of, you know, the, the unrestricted cross product is just all combinations. The relation is saying, yeah, just give me some, some special ones, right? Where this pair is related in some special way. So that's a 
relation in, in general. Um, often we look at a very special case of relations where you relate a set to itself, right? This ends up being a um, very special, particular case of relations. So a relation R um, on a set A. Notice I, I, I just said, specified just one set instead of two, right? So if you say a relation on a set um, is a relation from that set to itself, which is to say it's a subset of A cross A, right? that's what we're saying. So this is a really important special case. Um, to be honest, we probably use this, probably end up using this case with relations more than almost more than the more general case. Um, and in particular, we can have, um, a nice little example of, let's look at n being the set of um, natural numbers, right? It is a set of natural numbers here. And that's gonna be our a. And, Let R be the relation divisible, right? That is to say, two natural numbers are related if and only if A divides evenly into B. And when I say evenly, I mean without remainder, right? Some whole number of times into B. So another way to say this is to say that there exists some natural number k such that b equals k times a, right? You can multiply a by some whole number to get b. This is a good way to say the, the concept of divisibility, right? So um, this has lots of nice ways to be represented. Um, oh, oh, and I should mention um, this does have special notation because it comes up so so often, um, if you put just a vertical line, right, kind of a tall vertical line between A and B, that's exactly what that means. It means A divides B. That's how you read that. Right, so this one comes up frequently enough that there's a, a, a symbol for it that we use, a special symbol. Not all relations, of course, have a special symbol. There's no special single symbol that means has visited, right? That means person A has visited state B. But number A divides number B, we do have a special line for that, this vertical line. So this is our, um, this is a, a very famous relation. And there are there are different ways to um, represent this, right? Like I, like I mentioned before, um, you can, you could do this like we did before, where you show natural number, natural numbers, and then you show divisibility here as a relation. So you show, you know, here's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, right? So you could say, okay, 0, the, um, well, 0, by this definition, 0 divides 0, right? Um, but it doesn't, doesn't divide anything else, right? Because we say A divides B, if and only if you can multiply 
it by some number, a by some number to get b. So you can multiply zero by a number to get zero, but you can't multiply it by a number to get anything else. So by this definition, at least zero divides zero. Um, it's up to you if you want to define it different, differently and exclude zero completely, that's up to you. Um, and now one divides everything, right? You can always multiply one by a whole number to get another whole number. So one divides everything, right? Then two divides zero because two times zero is zero, right? Two divides two because two times one is two, right? Two divides four and so on, right? Three divides zero, three divides three, three divides six, which I didn't write on there, right? But, and so on. So you can, you know, it's quickly getting kind of messy and cluttered, but you can keep, you can keep drawing this diagram, right? Um, now, sometimes people kind of just leave it like that, the, right? Those two um, sets. When it's a relation on a set, a relation from a set to itself, sometimes it's actually more convenient to represent it kind of a different way. Um, you could draw it like this, where you draw all the elements just kind of together. Um, and you just put arrows where divisibility happens. All right, so this is a nice way to draw a relation, right? Except notice what's happening here. I, I also, in this picture, I also need to draw these arrows, one to six, one to four, right? So it makes you question, ugh, do I, do I really have to be do, drawing those arrows? Like I almost just don't want to even put them in the diagram, right? I want to show these arrows to show the divisibility relations. Um, but I kind of, I kind of don't want to. It seems like redundant somehow, right? Like one divides two, and then two divides four. So of course one divides four, right? So you sometimes what you want to do to understand your relations better, make them easier to represent, is you want to understand some properties of your relations, right? So these dashed arrows that are cluttering up the picture, right? The dashed arrows could be left out. I could eliminate them and say that they're just implied in this diagram. And of course, by the way, this keeps going, right? There are way more natural numbers. Uh, but these dashed arrows could be left out if only I was certain that A dividing B and B dividing C implied A divides C. Right, because then I can say, oh, okay, uh, you know, if you can follow any path from one number to another, then that relation between the first number and that last number holds, um, as opposed to having to draw every single one and really clutter up your your diagram, right? So, so this motivates the idea of, of some properties of relations. In particular, um, there are some very famous, very important properties of relations. There is a property called the reflexive property. So reflexive means that for every A in our set, right, A relates to A. This is, this is what it would mean for R to be reflexive. The, for the relation R to be reflexive, that every element relates to itself. So for example, divisibility is reflexive I didn't want to just write the symbol for divisibility there because it just looks like a one right it's, It just looks kind of dumb when you write it without operations on operands on each side, right? Divisibility is reflexive. 
because every natural number divides itself, right? It's always equal to one times itself, right? So that's reflexive. There's an operation called, or sorry, a property called symmetric, right? So symmetric says that for every pair of elements in your set, if A relates to B, then B relates to A. So the visibility is not symmetric. Right? Proof by counterexample. I'm trying to prove that not the negate, I'm trying to prove the negation of a for all, the Morgan's law, push the negation inside. You just need to show there exists one pair for which it's not true, right? So what would the counter example be? You could say three divides nine, but nine does not divide three. And the little slash through divides means does not. So this is a, Another property, another example, still on visibility, right? Um, transitive. This is the one we were talking about above, right? So a transitive relation is one for which for all A, B, and C in the set, if A relates to B and B relates to C, then A relates to see. This is the transitive property. And now divisibility is transitive. And this, let me take a second to see, um, to quickly justify it. It was far from a formal proof, but uh, the, the essence of the justification. Assume A divides B and B divides C for some arbitrary um, natural numbers, right, A, B, and C. Then what do we have? Well, we have that B equals K times A and C equals, let's say J times B for some natural numbers K and J, right? This is the definition of divisibility. So now what I could do is I could just sub actually this Ka, I could just sub that in for B in the other equation by substitution, right? And I get C equals JKA, right? Well, but multiplication is associative. So C is JKA, right? Well, JK is a natural number. So A divides C because C was A times something, right? So divisibility is transitive. Right? So these are um, these are some some super nice um, properties of relations, right? Reflexive, symmetric, transitive. These are the ones that probably come up the most often, but there are some other properties that are worth mentoring. Um, there's asymmetric. And asymmetric means the following. It means that if A and B, again, are elements of your set, means that A relate to B implies that B does not relate to A. And that's asymmetric. So here, divisibility is not asymmetric, right? Because nowhere does asymmetric say that you have to choose A and B to be distinct, right? Um, you have, you could, uh, 
have what? Two divides two. And if you switch them, you can't see that I switched the twos, but I did. <laughs> two still divides two, right? See, I, I pick A and B both to equal two, right? Well, then when you reverse the order, you still have divisibility, right? So, um, so divisibility is not asymmetric. So notice that asymmetric is not necessarily the opposite of being symmetric, right? It doesn't, it doesn't just mean not symmetric. It's its own property, right? Like divisibility is neither symmetric nor asymmetric. Either one, right? So there's another relation called anti-symmetric, which also is not the negation of being symmetric. This one says, following this says A, if A relates to B and B relates to A, then A equals B, right? So it's saying if your relation between two elements works both ways, then it must have been just an element relating with itself. But that was the only way for that to happen. Divisibility is actually anti-symmetric, right? If A divides B and B divides A, well, in the set of natural numbers, Right, what does that mean if A divides B and B divides A? Well, we didn't formally prove this, but one thing that's fairly intuitive is if A divides B, then A is less than or equal to B because you're multiplying it by um, Well, as long as long as b is non-zero, right? Um, so certainly, at least on the on the non-zero natural numbers, right? This is this holds, um, right? Because you're multiplying it by one or more, so b is greater than or equal to a. Um, and similarly, if b divides a, then b is less than or equal to a because you're multiplying it by some number that's one or more, right? So now, if a is less than or equal to b and b is less than or equal to a then what do I know? I know that A equals B. Right. So that's um, an example of being anti-symmetric. Now, this still works when, if one of them is zero, right? If, is it, yeah, so it still works, right? Um, zero only divides itself, right? So if you have a zero divides zero and zero divides zero, then zero equals zero, right? So it still works in the case where it's zero. Um, but it, you know the argument maybe there is a little different. All right, so there we have um, a whole bunch of definitions, right? A lot of definitions that we, once again, what did we define? We defined Cartesian product, right? We defined subset. Why? Well, because we wanted to define relations and relations are subsets of Cart Cartesian products. You can have the two sets be different sets, like say, set of people relating to the set of states by the relation of has visited, right? Um, and you can write a relation by just listing out pairs. You could also write a relation by doing these blob arrow diagrams. We'll do both as the semester goes on. Um, the, um, maybe, maybe the most often used case of relation is on a set, a set, right? So relation from a set to itself. Um, so you're doing the Cartesian product of a set with itself. And here, a the visibility, right, is a classic example of this relation where one number relates to another, if and only if it divides it. Um, some nice questions that you can ask about relations that, you know, when you know these properties, they make diagrams easier to draw and tell you lots about the structure of your relation, right? Include reflexive, does every element relate to itself? Symmetric. If A relates to B, does B relate to A? Transitive, if A relates to B and B relates to C, does A then necessarily relate to C? Asymmetric, if A relates to B, can you automatically conclude that B does not relate to A? And anti-symmetric, 
is the only case in which A relates to B and B relates to A, the case where A and B are equal to each other. Right. There we go. There we have our, um, our definitions, relations and the most impro important properties of relations. Great, thanks so much.